When we speak about the future, it's interesting to see when you talk to people around the world, which I do all the time, that in the last two years, maybe three years, the future is starting to look not so good. Right? Not just because of COVID, not just because of the war, but because of many reasons. My own children, 26 and 31, they should know better, right? <laughs> but they're saying, well, the future's not gonna be good. There's no work, there's climate change, there's bad people, doesn't look good. I think the future is better than we tend to think. And I think we need to have a story about the future that's positive. All you have to do is watch Netflix or whatever you're watching online. Yeah, it's all ending bad for us. First, the robots come and take your job, and then they harvest your body for energy. That's basically our end. So I want to talk about what's ahead, you know, now that we have the sort of COVID rebound, right? Now, right at the end, at the beginning of this rebound of, of a new door opening, right? We have a war. <laughs> like, come on, give me a break. We just went through COVID and now we have a war. We still have climate change. We have inequality. We have the machines coming. We have jobs going away, right? I think it's pretty safe to say what is awaiting for us, as was said earlier, business as usual is dead or dying. You know, I used to be a musician and producer, and in 1999, we went to the record companies and said, music is moving to the cloud. Right? People will play music on the mobile phone, click a button. They hated us, because the idea was like saying it's going to be free. Right? I think business as usual is dead is not a bad message. We're going to reinvent how it works, pretty much all of it. And if you haven't noticed, we have reinvented healthcare and the pandemic at 12, 13 months for a vaccine. Now the same technology is going to help us to fight cancer. We're reinventing money, digital money. We're reinventing energy. It's basically all coming back to back in a very quick succession. So what's really important is to understand this, we're not going back to normal. We're back to normal here, not wearing a mask, meeting each other, shaking hands, we go to the restaurant. But what has changed is inside. What has happened in the last two years is kind of like, you could say, either after World War II, like if you're 25 years old, it's kind of like a bit of two-year war. Couldn't do anything you wanted. For me, I was born in 61. I was too young to experience 1968, right? the cultural evolution, all of that. But it's kind of like this now. It's like a complete reset. Everything is resetting. How we travel, how we do tourism, what we buy, who we trust, who we vote. The women are coming, for example, around the world, right? Many governments around the world, women are the leaders. And one, the ones that were led by women have been more successful in the COVID times than the ones led by men. Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, Scandinavia, of course, Iceland, Germany, right? Now you have a green foreign minister. The government of Germany just hired the CEO of Greenpeace, Jennifer Morgan who was for 20 years or so total pain and, you know, a pain for all governments. Right? Now she is a government envoy. Can you imagine one of you becoming a government envoy? And consumers have all seen all these changes, which is good for us because it's been changes in work, working from home, changing in shopping, learning, living at home, right? My 75-year-old neighbor who has a smartphone didn't know how to use it, I explained to him 50 times. Right? In the COVID days, he learned how to order food online on his mobile phone. And what does he do now? He orders online. No longer necessary, but he changed his life. Right? So we can have a lot of it really interesting facts sort of here on this chart, saying that basically the risk of things that go wrong have gone up, up, and up, right? Social cohesion, livelihood crisis, climate action failure, you know, the list isn't even complete. So you're looking at this list and saying, how could we possibly talk about a good future? And the result is many people, for example, are quitting, right? You heard about the great resignation. I hope you guys aren't quitting, right? But you see this chart right here. Especially younger people, I have quit a job because it didn't fit. That could be my son. I would rather be unemployed than to be unhappy. I mean, I couldn't have said that ever in my career, right? even though I was self-employed. <laughs> can be unhappy with myself, I suppose. But this is how things change. 
And now, it's safe to say science fiction is becoming science fact. I mean, if you want to upload your brain to the internet, Elon Musk wants to help you by creating a brain-computer interface. Right? Probably to Elon's computer so he can learn from you. If you want to live in a, in a virtual world because the real world sucks, you know, it's really bad, you go to the metaverse. Escape exit, right? World is so bad, I live on the metaverse. And I don't need a body, I can just have a head in a dish, you know. Like, right? Science fiction is becoming science fact. There's many good things about this. Like this one fact, right? Most of the babies born in 2000 in industrialized countries will live to be 100 years old. Many of the kids of our kids will be 120 years old. Right? Will be very long retirement, you know, a long trip on the cruise ship for 40 years you know, on the coast of Greece, I suppose. But that is changing everything about what consumers do. Here's some forecasts about 2030. First, 9 billion people connected to the internet <laughs> in eight years. That's twice as many as today. What do they do? They buy, they sell, they do stuff, they interact. They do good things, they do bad things, but twice as many as today. And we have the emergence of this global consciousness. I know it sounds strange, right? When you look at what's happening right now in Russia. Right? It's more like unconsciousness. But when you think about consciousness, people are saying, okay, we're going to think of each other. Right? Collaborative, responsible, circular. There's people saying that a company that is not circular, which means sustainable all around, will cease to exist in 10 years. Pretty much any company. Ten years ago, we thought that talking about circular and sustainable was an after-dinner conversation. Right? Bertolt Brecht, famous German author, once said, first dinner, then morals. Right? And now it's finally become the next business model. 3D printing, now the technologies, changing consumption, our supply chains are being redone. In good ways and in bad ways, but forever. And this convergence of real life and virtual life. Again, this could be heaven, or it could be hell. Many of us already have too many relationships with our screens. So imagine if that screen was here, or here, right? I could escape. Well, you escape on the mobile phone, right? At the same time, we have a new human renaissance. Like in the, in the COVID uh, years, the two years, I couldn't travel. I usually do 100 events a year. So I did a lot of that online. And all of a sudden, I realized one day that one actual event in real life is worth 100 on Zoom. And now I say one hug is worth more than 1,000 Zoom calls. Of course, Zoom calls don't provide hugs. Yeah. Bad comparison. But now people are saying it's important to be human. And that's actually really changed things. Right? And the leading brands are becoming engaged in socio-economic, human, cultural, policy, political issues. There is no way a company today can stay away from policy and from, from culture, right? In any which way you look at it. Everything we're talking about here is political. And somebody has another opinion, right? Climate change is political. Artificial intelligence is political. Technology of relation is political. And this is kind of where we all come to look at this chart here. Basically, this is research from economists showing that CEOs should step in when governments don't fix problems. And guess who is the leader, right? Not us here in Europe. India, China, Mexico, Brazil, where people think that. If you run a company in the next 10 years, get ready to get involved with social issues, whether it's about uh, gender issues, whether it's about um, employment policy, whether it's about whatever comes up in the long run. So now we're facing this future, and there's one response is to be super excited, and the other one is to hide. And in Europe, we're very good with hiding, right? Because uh, let's face it, in Europe, you know, we're by and large, we love the present and the past. The future is scary to us. That has to change. Right? I'm so glad we're here now talking about this, because really what's happening is exponential change. We're leaping into the future. Exponential means not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, but 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. And the funny part is when you go 1, 2, 3, linear, it's almost the same than 1, 2, 4, which is exponential. But after 4, you take off. 
So you can expect in the next 10 years new paradigms, new narratives, new lifestyles, new rules, new skills we need. And this is a crucial moment in humanity because if we do not fix the things that are not currently not working so well, not just climate, but other ones, right? It's kind of the short runway, 10, 20 years. Right? If you have kids or you're going to have kids, you've got to think about that. Right? The future is not what future, what, uh, about what's possible, it's about what kind of thing do we want to leave to our kids. And that's an interesting conversation to have. So again, exponential, 30 steps, linear, you know, step by step, I get to the exit door. 30 steps exponential, it's 26 trips around the world. There's the difference. This is what technology does. The computing power of this thing here, right here, my iPhone, is more than what, what brought the Americans to the moon in the entire setup of their computers in whatever, 61, whenever that was, right? It's all in here. So here, we see clearly what's happening, what's becoming possible. The next 10 years bring more change than the previous 100 years. And that should get us excited. I mean, look at this chart. Sustainability revolution, energy, protein, transportation, investing. I tasted artificial meat from the lab. You know, that, that's made from, the, from a cow, but not a dead cow, but just the cells, right? <laughs> Called cultured meat. Three years ago, I couldn't tell the difference. Oh, it sounds disgusting, right? But, well, it's not. Right? And, and Bill Gates is an investor. He's saying basically in 10 years, this meat is going to be one-tenth to one-twentieth of regular meat. We can feed everybody. So next is everybody in this room, right? After all of these industries, it's fashion, clothing, apparel, retail that's going through this fundamental change. It's as big of a change than going from the CD in the old days of the, of the music business to music in the cloud. Don't make the same mistake by saying, you know, if this happens, then we won't be part of it because there won't be any money. Do you know how many people are subscribed to Spotify or Apple Music? How much money comes in there? 185 million a month. Subscribe, 10 euros, $10 each, sometimes less. That's almost $2 billion. New money. This is not about not making money. It's about making shift how we make money. Right? In the car industry, I spoke there last year in, in Germany um, at the IAA event. The car industry is no longer about cars. It's about mobility. Right? It's about all that stuff you see here. And the same thing is going to happen with retail and fashion. We have to think wider. What do you sell? How do you sell it? Right? Now car companies are saying in the future, we will not be sell selling units of cars, but units of service. And Porsche and Volvo already have a subscription program like Spotify. That's going to happen for clothes, for sure. If I love a brand, right, I subscribe. Interesting angle how that unfolds sort of in parallel works. Like we can see what's happening with 3D printing. We talked about 3D printing for a long time. Never happened, really. Well, it did happen, but we didn't really notice it in a large way. And now we can print kneecaps, we can print earlobes, we can print glasses, we can print shoes. Right? It's going to be very hard to explain in 10 years how we ever lived without a 3D printer. I mean, if you're talking to a 14-year-old, they say, well, basically, they can't imagine life without this. They've never been disconnected. You know, when my son was 10, we went to Tanzania for a trip. The first time in his life, where he couldn't get online, he thought his phone was broken. It's like, no, no internet here, right? Not the phone, no internet. It's like, what? Unbelievable. So 3D printer, same story. And we're going into this world where this kind of idea, like we're going to print shoes, it's, it's kind of a dematerialization, where we don't need the original material, like the cow or whatever, right? But we have a rematerialization by having new f formats. That gives you a lot to think about, and ownership, and value, and all these discussions. I, let me say right here, you know, I don't really believe that virtual goods are a great opportunity for the immediate future. I think it's something that's going to egg on everything else. Right? Remember that people aren't virtual, no matter, no matter how much you want to be. The people that live virtually are the gamers. I don't know if any of you are gamers. Right? They, they really truly live virtually, but we are still human beings. And the question I have is, you know, what's going to happen with genes, for example, if we can print 
them, like has been tried many times and never really worked. Right? More sound? That is a pan-fried catfish from Star Trek, 1974, the Star Trek replicator. Of course, that doesn't really exist, right? But you can print pizza. You can print ice cream. You can print earlobes. You can print hearts, in some way at least. Something to think about where that's going into that future, what's going to happen with this and which way we're heading. So, not science fiction anymore. And this is your job, is to say, what is going to be science fiction now and what is actual reality? This is the meat from the lab. Right? You can check it out, called Memphis Meats and many others. That's reality now. It's actually being sold in America. It's even sold here, I think, in Holland for uh, vegan substitutes. So, we're moving into the future where you have a complex map. I call them mega shifts. And you can download this chapter, it's from my, from my last book, megashifts.digital for free. But you should read the whole thing, it's about 13 pages, in, including Turkish, I think, and many other languages, 13 languages. But the hard part is that it's a moving map. Right? Digitization, robotization, virtualization, <laughs> cognification. We used to laugh and call them the Asians because they all end with Asian. But really what happens here is it gives you stuff like this. And it gives you this impact on, on what's happening with retail like this. In this video, you will learn how to react in the case of an unhappy customer in one of our stores. O atendimento ao cliente é fundamental e é necessário aprender a lidar com clientes irritados e descontentes que podem não ter recebido o nível de serviço que esperavam. Imagine customer service being available with this app called Synthia, if that's available in 40 languages, in real time. I mean, if you use language translation now, it kind of works, but not really. You have to be very slow, like talk like a, you know, slow-moving person. But basically, this is the future, right? It's going to change everything and how we do things all around us in different ways. And here's a chart that's going to be really interesting, right? The virtualization of the world, real commerce, traditional, declining, e-commerce increasing, and on top of that, social commerce. People buying and selling to each other on social networks. Personally, I find it not very interesting. I'm, very, I'm not... 25, right? But if you go to China, that's like, check this out. I mean, it's basically what everybody does there, right? It's a process of social commerce is, is making billions already. That's something you have to look at. I mean, for me, it's like the social part of my life is not so connected to buying and selling, you know? I find that a little bit strange, but it's a cultural question. What we have to remember when we think about the future is this, right? Culture eats technology for breakfast. No matter what ideas you may have, how, how cool this stuff is, you have to find the right people that like it. And it's also about fragmentation. I mean, in Spotify, you have millions of people listening to, you know, Goa trends or Turkish or Goha music, yeah? Uh, and it's all over the place. And you don't know that they exist even. Right? It's all in fragments. That's part of the hard message of the future, how we're going to find new things. The most important understanding here is this from 1999, a book by Pine and Gilmore, talking about the experience economy. And they were very early with this idea, but really what's happening is the value is shifting from selling stuff and goods and even services to selling experiences. Why is Tesla so successful? It doesn't sell a car. It sells an experience. And that experience transforms my life if I use it. And I'm hooked. Right? This is why I'm an Apple user. <laughs> and you're just hooked forever. That, that's what you have to find, whether you're a clothing retailer or an e-commerce site or a, a, you know, a portal. I mean, Amazon is the king of this, right? It's like, it's like glue that just keeps going and growing and growing. So I want to show you this video. You may guess who it is. Anybody? Come on. You can recognize this guy. No, just kidding. I'm showing this video for a certain reason, but first I'll play it. Special relevance for me when I was a kid. I was, a, uh, I was on a tour with the Stones as a, as a stagehand, you know, setting up stuff, so I got to watch that every night. Mick Jagger is amazing, right? But I'm showing you this because the robot, which is from Boston Dynamics, is really cool. Right? And it does great stuff. It took him a long time to learn that, probably. Right? But what's the difference between Mick and the robot? The robot isn't Mick, and Mick isn't the robot, right? It's completely different. 
It's apples and oranges. It's basically a simulation versus real. Let's not lose fact of what's real. Simulations are great, but they're not real. I mean, you can choose for them to be real, but nobody's going to go to a concert to watch the Boston Dynamics dog perform Start Me Up. Right? We have to keep that in mind, you know, how these things are kind of overlapping and where that's going. We have to be careful of this idea of a mousetrap. Yeah? A lot of people are talking to me about artificial intelligence, you know, faster selling, better integration, process automation. That's all great, but we shouldn't use it as a mousetrap for the customer. You know, the mousetrap master is Facebook, right? Facebook is only a giant algorithmic mousetrap. That's why I left five years ago. That's all I do. And they harvest $160 million per day in that mousetrap. But now they're crashing, right? Windows closing. So what you have to do is the opposite, which is the magnet. Right? Not force people into something because of some clever tech. You're always going to need clever tech, right? But to make yourself attractive. This is the key to the future of retail, right? Let's get real. Magnets, not mousetraps. And this is real basically with the meaning we talked about earlier. Something larger. Not a good deal, not a good price, but purpose. Right? People, planet, purpose, and prosperity, which is the motto of my work. Right? You have to have prosperity, but it sounds better than profit, I think. Yeah is to prosper, right? But purpose, what does it mean to build that and to be the brand that you want to be? Very, very important. We're moving in a future where we're going from this simple motto, Milton Friedman, good old capitalism, right? Okay, it worked, made us money, but it gave us this, right? Look at the numbers for climate change, CO2, weather abnormalies, right? It gave us this, kids around the world they think humanity is doomed, and the future is frightening. <laughs> That's hardly going to be a solution for our kids to say, well, we have lots of money, but unfortunately, systems are collapsing. So if you're really rich, you can fly to Mars, like Elon will, no doubt. And the worst part is that your customers are these guys, right? Gen Z, Z, and Gen Y. And this is what they're thinking. So it's time to make that switch from this old-fashioned profit and growth to put that in one corner and come up with a larger story. Right. We should only get bonuses, dividends, awards if we tick all four boxes. And now there's a stock market that does this called the Long-Term Stock Exchange in San Francisco. That's what they do. The markets will reward you taking this direction very soon. Right now it's a bit of an upheaval because of COVID and the war. But next year, I think we're going to see that become sort of a mainstream. I love this idea, for example, of the product passport. Where has it been? Where has, what, what has it gone through? What are the mechanics behind it? Gives clarity. Very simple idea. It shows you care. Many of you are probably already thinking about this. I know it's complicated, but I love the idea of this. We're moving just like the car industry from ego systems, right? Ego systems, Mercedes-Benz, Daimler, Audi, GM, you know, Closed systems. Now we're moving into an ecosystem. You can't do this alone, you have to do it together. Right? The entire fashion apparel clothing industry is shifting to an ecosystem, right, to where we're all hanging together, doing different things, making it possible together. There's lots of moving parts. And this is taken off right now, as was said earlier. And here's the important part. You know, all of the sustainability stuff that we talk about was just talk for a long time. Now it's a business plan. It's humanity's business plan. That's it. And remember also that green is the new digital. Green is the new power of where everything comes from. We're going from the agricultural industrial revolution, which took about agricultural 1,500 years on the 50 years for this, to the digital revolution, and then right now the sustainability revolution. If you miss either one of the two, you're toast. I mean, of course, everybody's going digital, right? But technology will not save the day just because it's technology. You've got to go a little bit further than that. Right? And behind that is the idea of what I call reformation, which is to rethink what everything is all about and who gets what. And this is happening right now. So as soon as the war winds down and we find a solution there, 
you're waiting for a key to the golden era. I know it sounds strange, right? But basically, a lot of energy is going to get unpinned here, yeah, where we're going to do the changes that we didn't think of before. Big blue technology, big green, and big human. That's the ticket to the future. Okay. And I think that's really true for all business, but especially in fashion and apparel, because now we have people saying we should have, like in New York, a Fashion Sustainability and Social Accountability Act. If, you don't, if you're not first in initiating this, you will be initiated to do that, right? I mean, just search for all the stuff about Sustainability Act and fashion, pumping the brakes on fast fashion. Fills pages, endless scrolling, right? So that's coming, we're moving in the right direction. That brings me to the next example, the cruise ship. Great example. When I was a musician, I played on a cruise ship. Thereby, I hate them. No, just kidding. I hate them for other reasons. It's a great example. We can save every activity and, and make it sustainable, but probably not the cruise ship. <laughs> this is one of those examples where we should think about, yeah, it's probably not going to be about degrowth, you know, making it all circular and stuff. We do that anyway. Our future is not going to be about degrowth. Yeah. Not having kids, not eating a lot, not going outside, not, not wasting CO2. That strikes me as an unlikely scenario. <laughs> because right, humans are always growing. We have to figure out how to grow inclusively and to pay what it takes. If you like to eat meat, if you really paid what it costs to eat meat, you'd be paying 40 times as much. So we have to think about what that means, where that's going. I think too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. You know, when we think about doing stuff like this, well, maybe we should do it, but differently. And that's going to be, I think, a hard one for the near future. That brings me to the metaverse, just one word on this, and then I'll wrap up my talk. The metaverse is one of those things. You can say, well, it, it could be very interesting to hang out in there and meet people and, you know, have virtual fashion shows and all. Yeah, interesting, definitely. But I sometimes think, okay, if it really works, maybe it could be more like a meta-perverse, right? which means what I really like, I don't get to do anymore. Right? Or in other words, you could say, Everything I've ever wanted, but nothing that I really need. <laughs> that could be the metaverse. We have to be very careful with understanding where this is going. This is take the mobile phone and social media, multiply by 1,000, you have the metaverse. So let's take a good look at what we want there and where that's going and what exactly it can do. Because here's the bottom line about your future. Right? Trust isn't digital. You don't have people's trust and interest, you have nothing. No matter how fancy your tech is. Right? Customers aren't data, and happiness is not a download. This is all something that happens between us. This is what happens between humans, right? <coughs> Engagement, experiences, relationships. That's how you sell your stuff. Right? So the bottom line here really is awesome technology, great technology, but even more awesome humans, right, to bring them together into the future. So quick summary, and then we're off to the happy drinks. This example of the meat in Brazil, right, called the Futuro Burger. I love this one because, you know, it has the future in it. Right? It's already selling. But here's what we can learn from this, right? You have to get ahead of your customers and be ready to greet them when they arrive. You have to be in the future when they are ready to look at it. If you are waiting with your customers for the future to arrive, you'll be the one that's got run over by the likes of Tesla. And how do you get to the future? You have to spend time there. You have to imagine it. By the time we're waiting, like the record companies waited for Spotify, right? And now they're making lots of money with Spotify. But the record companies are no longer important. Does anyone in this room sign a, a, a deal with a major record label? <laughs> what? What are you talking about, major? Who are they? Right? Do we still know who they are in 10 years? Just because they own the rights, of course. Right? So for that, to understand the future is about imagination. Let's not think for a moment that we can calculate the future with a spreadsheet. <laughs> or we can go to the university and study the future, and then we know the future. There's no such thing. Jeff Bezos is probably the most uh, uh, knowledgeable man in e-commerce, right? He said the other day, I study all that stuff, I look at everything, I talk, to, I do focus groups. In the end, it's my gut feel. That's how we got to build an empire like this. 
gut feel and intuition. This writer in India, C.K. Prahalad, says, imagine the future may be more important than analyzing the past, and I would go further, analyzing the present. Companies today are no longer resource-bound, they're imagination-bound. We are resource-bound because we have all kinds of supply chain issues and all that, yes. But it's about our imagination that is our future, to reimagine what people would be doing. And also, you know, this is kind of an ideal, you know, it doesn't really exist yet. But we can imagine it, and we can build our way towards it. So, spend 45 minutes a day on things that are not already here. The future. I'm not talking about Netflix here, right? Watching movies. <laughs> I'm talking about reading, right? spending time. Right? Bill Gates calls this the five-hour rule. You spend five hours a week on something that is coming and not already here, you create your future. Good old-fashioned reading, not printed books necessarily, but books, you know, I read on the Kindle. There's a long list on my website, but these are some of the ones. Number one is The Future, uh, The Ministry for the Future. That's a, actually a science fiction novel. That's my favorite read right now, Kim Stanley Robinson. When you do that, you don't have an advantage in the beginning, right? Because you're slower. You're reading, right? Reading isn't fast. But after a while, yeah, your curve takes off like this. It's like compound interest. I guarantee you, if we read again in five years and you've been reading for five years, you'll be a leader. Right? And you'll be making lots of positive things. So as new doors are now opening, many doors have closed, new, new doors are opening. Here's the important question. Right? What kind of world do we want? Not just in terms of climate change, but in every case. Right? And there it's important that we stop thinking of the future as being screwed. Right? Because we look at all the stuff around us, we watch the news, we watch the Black Mirror, we watch you know, humans, we watch all this stuff, and we think, oh, it's going to be bad. Right? Famous futurist uh, Buckminster Fuller once said, as you see the future, so you act, and as you act, so you become. Right? Self-fulfilling prophecy. You think the future is bad, your job is going to go away, it will. Finding a way forward into a better future. So going back to what I said earlier, my mantra, the future is better than we think. I encourage you to think about that, take that home with you, and build the future. Have a positive view on the future that is better than we think. Thanks for your time.